Hello and welcome to a virtual tour of South Bend St. Joseph Polish Roman Catholic Cemetery. My name is Travis Childs and I'm the Director of Education at the History Museum in South Bend. And I'm also your St. Joseph County Historian. Thanks for tuning in this evening. I first must apologize for this evening's pronunciation of names of the people we are going to visit. Since most of the names are in Polish, I've had problems properly pronouncing most of the last names and had to check with my fellow Polish colleagues on pronunciation. My apologies to those of you who are Polish descent. I don't mean any disrespect. With that out of the way, let's get going. By the late 1800s and early 1900s, 25% of South Bend's population was Polish-born. While in the South Bend area, the local Polish had established Polish Catholic churches, Polish neighborhoods, and Polish stores. However, by 1900, the only Catholic burial ground was Cedar Grove Cemetery on the campus of Notre Dame. Most South Bend Polish lived on the west side of town and were troubled by having to submit to what was seen as a burial monopoly at Cedar Grove since it was the only sanctioned cemetery in the area. So by 1901, there were mentions in the local newspaper that a group of Poles wanted to create a cemetery for their Polish Roman Catholic brethren. When the paperwork was drawn up and land purchased, a controversy began. The diocese of the area was overseen by the bishop at Fort Wayne. The bishop made the announcement that the diocese would own the new cemetery. This obviously upset the group trying to establish the new cemetery, and it got worse. The different Polish associations started to work with the approval of the bishop of Fort Wayne, who was also the honorary president of the cemetery group. Between 1904 and 1906, the Polish of South Bend began raising money and eventually purchased property on the far west side of town. The group also established a funeral insurance plan to help the community prepay for their funerals. However, the bishop of Fort Wayne announced that since the cemetery association would not transfer ownership to the diocese, he, in turn, would not formally bless the cemetery grounds until it was turned over to the diocese. Traditional Catholic doctrine required that human remains be buried in consecrated ground or ground blessed by a priest or bishop and deemed an appropriate final resting place by the church. On March 21, 1906, a meeting was held where over 300 people who had contributed to the project voted to incorporate the cemetery. The bishop announced that not only was he not blessing the cemetery grounds, but he forbade all priests in the diocese to provide a Christian burial in the new cemetery. While the controversy continued for the next two years, Catholic parishioners were being buried in St. Joseph Polish Roman Catholic Cemetery without the benefit of a Christian burial. Local clergy could do nothing as they were bound to obey the bishop. An agreement was reached that was approved by the bishop that allowed Father Zuvavich of St. Kashmir Church to bless the individual graves of each person buried at St. Joseph. Father Zuvavich had told the bishop that any further pressure or restrictions brought by the bishop would only cause a potential split and break from the Roman Catholic Church by Polish parishioners. And in 1914, that's exactly what happened. Father Zubowicz was transferred to the St. Hedgewick Parish, and the bishop's refusal to discuss a replacement priest at St. Kashmir with those in leadership at St. Kashmir and many other priest replacement were against parishioners' wishes caused many Polish to break with the Roman Catholic Church and joined St. Mary's of the Holy Rosary Polish National Catholic Church in 1914, which still exists with a church located on West Sample Street. If you want to learn more about St. Kashmir's Riot, as they called it, search Wikipedia for St. Kashmir Parish, South Bend. This is the final resting place for David Grzegorik. David was born January 3, 1948 in South Bend and grew up at 739 South Kenmore Street. He was a 1965 graduate of Washington High School and had won awards for gymnastics while in high school. After graduating, David enrolled in the United Electronics Institute of Louisville, Kentucky. While attending school, David lived in an apartment with three other students in Shively, Kentucky, which is a suburb of Louisville. Five students from the institute were at the apartment with four of them playing around with a 22 caliber pistol. A sixth student awoke and began fighting for control of the pistol 
warning that a live round was in the chamber. During the scuffle, the gun discharged with a bullet hitting David on the right side of his chest and lodging into his spine. He died upon arrival at Louisville General Hospital on July 25, 1966, at the age of 18. This is a grave for Stanley Stan Kovaleski. Stanley was born Stanislaus Kovaluski on July 13, 1889, in Shimokin, Pennsylvania. He was the youngest of five brothers, all whom played baseball. Stanley went to work in a Pennsylvania coal mine at the age of 12. One week, he worked 72 hours for which he received $3.75. Stanley was rarely able to play baseball as a child due to his work schedule. However, he filled every free moment practicing his pitching skills by throwing small stones at tin cans on a log at 50 feet. When he was 18 years old, his pitching abilities caught the attention of a local semi-professional baseball club who invited him to pitch for the team. After five games with the team, Kovaleski moved to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Stanley signed his first professional contract in 1909 with the minor league team called the Lancaster Red Roses. In 272 innings of pitching in his first season, Kovaleski won 23 games and lost 11 with an ERA of 1.95. In September 1912, the Philadelphia Athletics called him up to the major leagues and he made his first major league debut on September 10, 1912. After the 1914 season, Stanley had won 20 games, lost 15, pitched over 300 innings, and led the league in strikeouts. Stanley left the Athletics and moved to the Portland Beavers where he began to learn and perfect the throwing of a spitball. A spitball is where a pitcher places a foreign substance like saliva or petroleum jelly onto the baseball to change its aerodynamics. Stanley originally used chewing tobacco for the spitball, then later used alum on the ball. Of course, today this cheat is illegal in professional baseball. In 1916, the Cleveland Indians purchased Stanley from Portland, and he made his debut for the Indians in 1916. At the beginning of the 1920 baseball season, the spitball was outlawed, but the league allowed the current spitball pitchers to continue their pitching technique. Stanley continued to improve as a pitcher and eventually led the Indians to win the 1920 World Series against the Brooklyn Robins. He had managed an earned run average during the World Series of .67, which remains a World Series record. He was also first in strikeouts during the 1920 season, striking out 133 batters. Stanley also played for the Washington Senators and played for the New York Yankees in 1928. Stanley Kovaleski retired from baseball in 1929 and moved to South Bend, where he ran Kovaleski Service Station for a time. His service station was located at 1012 West Western Avenue. Also while living in South Bend, Stanley frequently gave free baseball lessons to local children. Stanley Kovaleski had ended his baseball career with a record of 215 wins, 142 losses, 224 complete games, 38 shutouts, 21 saves, 981 strikeouts, and an ERA of 2.89. In 1969, he was elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame, and in 2001, he was listed number 58 among the all-time greatest pitchers. Stanley Kovaleski died in a South Bend nursing home on March 20th, 1984, at the age of 94. Albin John Janovic lived in South Bend and almost a year before the bombing of Pearl Harbor, Albin had enlisted in the Army on January 16, 1941. He trained with the 1st Cavalry at Fort Bliss, Texas. In April of 1943, he was sent to Australia where he became involved in the Guadalcanal campaign. He fought on Leyte and was one of the first to land in the Philippine Islands. On March 17, 1944, he was wounded during action on Manus Island, but quickly recovered and returned to his unit. Miss Stella Janovic, Albin's mom, didn't hear much from her son until she received a visit from an army sergeant and an army chaplain to inform her that Albin had been killed on the island of Luzon, March 2, 1945. 
In August of 1945, Alvin's mom received a small box with a silver star that had been awarded to her son for his action on the island of Luzon. The citation with the silver star read, For gallantry in action on March 2, 1945, Sergeant Yanovic, a platoon sergeant, having encountered Japanese machine gun and mortar fire from a concealed enemy position, was forced to withdraw his platoon to suitable safety. Sergeant Janovic directed his men to their positions, and when the platoon position was secure, he began to crawl to the rear to his radio to report the situation to his troop commander. In order to reach the radio, it was necessary for him to cross a space of open ground which afforded no cover or concealment. While crossing this area, Sergeant Janovic was struck and fatally wounded by enemy sniper fire. Although suffering from painful wounds with grim determination and fortitude, he crawled to the radio and made a report of the action and enemy situation. The accurate report made possible the employment of heavy counterfire that silenced the enemy fire, thus preventing further casualties and permitting the continued advance of the troop. Sergeant Yanovic had two brothers. One was stationed on Luzon and the other brother was fighting in Germany. Both of Albin's brothers returned to South Bend safely. Sergeant Albin Yanovic was 26 years old and buried here with full military honors. Kashmir Kalpchinsky was born in South Bend on October 10, 1929. He grew up and graduated from high school and went to work for the Roach Appleman Manufacturing Company, which made all kinds of fuse boxes and switches. On the night of June 28, 1961, Kashmir was walking along the New York Central Railroad tracks behind the Northern Indiana Grocery Warehouse near the corner of Walnut and Western Avenue. Police said that Delos Carmichael, the engineer of the freight train coming from Elkhart, told them he saw Kashmir on the railroad right-of-way and gave two short blasts on the train horn to warn the man. Engineer Carmichael said he saw Kashmir turn and then fall across the rails as the train, traveling about 50 miles an hour, bore down on him. The engineer said he first saw Kopinskinski walking along the south side of the track seconds before he turned in an attempt to cross the north sides of the track. Police theorized that Kashmir may have tripped as he was attempting to cross the tracks because the footing was poor in the location where the accident occurred. The engineer also told police he braked the 96 car freight train when he saw Kashmir fall, but the train was traveling too fast to stop. Even though it first appeared as an accident, the St. Joseph County coroner officially ruled Kalpachinsky's death a suicide. Kashmir died instantly at 11.20 p.m. June 28, 1961. He was 32 years old. This is the final resting place for Adrian Daniliovitz. He was born in South Bend on March 22, 1935. He was employed by the South Bend Street Department. On May 2, 1959, at 1 in the morning, Mr. Daniliovitz was driving a car with Miss Barbara Metzger of Laporte as a passenger. Miss Metzner was the owner of the car. The couple were four miles east of Laporte on Indiana 2 when their car crashed head-on with a semi-truck. Both Mr. Dunlinovitz and Miss Metzner were dead on arrival at the hospital. Dean Flanagan of Galleon, Ohio, who was driving the truck, escaped injury. Mr. Flanagan told sheriff deputies that he was driving west into Laporte and Mr. Dunlinovitz was driving east. Flanagan said he was driving about 40 miles an hour when the car came around a curve at a high rate of speed, crossed the center line, and hit his truck head on. The deputy said Mr. Danowitz's car was three feet over the center line on the wrong side of the road at the point of impact. The impact of the crash spun the car 13 feet in the opposite direction of travel. The semi-truck continued along the shoulder past the car wreckage for another 130 feet before stopping. Mr. Daniliovitz suffered a deadly skull fracture, and Miss Metzger had a crushed skull and chest, along with a broken neck, hip, and right arm. Adrian Joseph Daniliovitz left a wife and daughter. Miss Metzner left two daughters. Adrian was just 24 years old. 
Clemens Buziak was born in South Bend on February 28, 1922, and lived at 613 South Mead Street. At the age of 14, he was employed as a newspaper delivery boy for the local Polish newspaper called the Polish Daily Skolba, or Agreement. Four years later, Clemens was still delivering the Polish newspaper on his bicycle when, on May 1, 1940, he was struck and killed by a police car driven by Indiana State Policeman Donald Woodward. Officer Woodward, believing that Clemens was still alive, rushed him and his patrol car to Epworth Hospital. However, it was discovered Clemens died almost instantly from a basal skull fracture. According to the county coroner, Clemens was riding his bike west on Western Avenue on the right side of the street. As he approached Pulaski Street, he made a sharp turn into the path of the state police car, which was also traveling west in an attempt to enter Pulaski Street. Clemens Buziak was 18 years old. Staff Sergeant Walter Cheshelsky was born in South Bend on June 24, 1918, and attended St. Adalbert's Parish Elementary School. He went on to attend South Bend Catholic High School, where he was a star football fullback before graduating in 1935. Walter enrolled in St. Viator's College in Bourbon, Illinois, on a scholarship. Upon graduation from college, he was hired by the Oliver Farm Equipment Corporation here in South Bend, where he was working when World War II started. He enlisted in the Army Air Corps and was stationed in the Army Air Base at Clovis, New Mexico. On March 25, 1943, Sergeant Chaselski was a bombardier pilot in a U.S. bomber group flying east to deliver B-17 bombers for use in Europe. As Chelsesky's plane approached the Sangre de Cristo Mountains near Trinidad, Colorado, all the gauges in the plane shut off and the plane crashed into the mountainside. Seven other Army Corps members also died in the crash. On March 34, 1943, Staff Sergeant Walter Chelsesky's body arrived at South Bend Union Station with a guard of honor from the American Legion that escorted his body to his parents' home. Walter's parents were well known to the South Bend community because they ran a very popular grocery store and meat market at 445 South Mead Street. Walter was 24 years old. This is the final resting place for Joseph Petula, who was born on March 9, 1890 in Gorky, Dabski, Poland. He worked alongside his parents and two sisters on a Polish baron's farm until they had saved enough money to immigrate to America. They all left Liverpool, England, bound for America on April 3, 1906. They arrived in New York Harbor on April 12, 1906. The Petula family moved westward and settled here in South Bend. At the outbreak of World War I, Joseph enlisted as an American soldier. However, since he was not an illegal American citizen, he was not allowed to carry any weapons. So, he spent the war digging graves for those soldiers who died during the battles. Close to the end of the war, Joseph was digging a grave when a German mustard gas attack occurred and he was partially burned. After the war, Joseph Pichula returned home where he became an American citizen in 1918. Just five years later, at the age of 33, Joseph died from the lasting effects of being exposed to poisonous gas during the Great War. This is the grave site for Aloysius Corporal. Mr. Corporal was born in South Bend on January 30, 1909, and attended the local schools. After graduating, he became a partner in his father's clothing store located at 1139 Western Avenue that was named Lot Corporal Men's Clothing Store. Aloysius Corporal was later elected to the Indiana State Legislature in 1931 and served one term. On May 19, 1936, Mr. Corporal became sick, and 10 days later, on May 29, 1936, he was dead at the age of 27. After a coroner's inquest, it was determined that Aloysius Corporal died of peritonitis, probably caused by an undetected burst appendix. On August 14, 1914, a large electrical storm rolled through Michiana. 
the high-tension power lines for the Northern Indiana Interurban Railway had been blown down around Lydic, Indiana, and the power lines had crossed some of the communication wires. Since the power lines were down, the Northern Indiana Interurban cars had no electricity in order to run. Thaddeus Kaminsky was a conductor on the rail line and in charge of car number seven, which was now stuck close to St. Mary's College, north of downtown South Bend. He walked several feet to a service phone box to call the dispatcher to find out the status of the power outage and stepped into the booth and took down the receiver. Unknown to Mr. Kaminsky was that the power lines down at Lydic were across the Northern Indiana Railway's phone lines. As he picked up the receiver, standing on the ground, he completed the electrical circuit, which promptly shoved 3,500 volts of electricity through Kaminsky's body. The police were called, and they tried to use something called a pole motor, an early respiratory resuscitation device, but to no avail. They were too late to help Mr. Kaminsky. He was dead at 24 years old. Adam Rukowski was born here in South Bend on August 8, 1899, and grew up in South Bend and eventually moved to Mishawaka. After high school, he found a job at Studebaker as a machinist. On February 25, 1932, Adam had the day off and decided to accompany his friend, Ralph Alexander, on his rounds with the Shell Oil Company. Mr. Alexander was a maintenance man for the Shell Company and had a regular route going throughout the Michigan area visiting remote Shell gas stations. While traveling on Western Avenue in the rural area of St. Joseph County, Mr. Alexander's truck had just crested a small hill when he saw a parked trailer sticking out into his lane of travel. Mr. Alexander immediately swerved his truck to the left, hit a telephone pole, and eventually hit an old Victorian iron fence. One of the iron pickets of the fence was thrown into the back of the truck's cab and was driven into the back of Adam Rukowski's head, killing him instantly. Adam's funeral was held on Monday, February 29, 1932. He was only 32 years old and left a wife and three young children. And ladies and gentlemen, that is the conclusion of this virtual cemetery tour. I hope you learned something and had a good time. Our next cemetery tour will be an in-person tour and will take place August 26 at 6.30 p.m. at Mishawaka City Cemetery, which is very close to the corner of Main and Jefferson Streets, just north of downtown Mishawaka. To learn more about this tour, just visit our website, historymuseumsb.org, and you can also keep up to date with all of our cemetery tour offerings by following Michiana Cemetery Tours on Facebook. You just visit Facebook and search for Michiana Cemetery Tours. Once again, thank all of you for your interest in our local community, and we hope to see you in person in August. <music>